with that, um, let me introduce our first lecturer, Peter Graham from Stanford University. Uh, so Peter Graham has uh, done some of the most interesting work, I think, uh, over the past decade or so on novel ways to probe dark matter. Um, my first introduction to his work was when I was in graduate school. Um, so we're now colleagues on the, the GM radio experiment um, and also in, in SQMS. Uh, but Peter's been thinking for quite a long time about using atomic systems, you know, novel um, uh, superconducting systems, uh, aspects of electrical engineering and quantum detection in the service of things like dark matter and gravitational wave detection. So trying to use the tools that have been developed in, in quantum sensing to address some of the most fundamental problems in particle physics that we have today. Uh, so um, in addition to being a professor at Stanford, so Peter won the 2017 New Horizons Prize in Physics in recognition of, of uh, um, all of his work in, in these very interesting and novel experimental directions. Um, and sort of close to you know my heart, Peter is the kind of person that is not satisfied with just writing an idea down on paper. He actually wants to turn it into an experiment. Um, and so he's really been an inspiration for me in terms of you know how do you go from you know having some idea for how to detect something to actually convincing your experimental colleagues it's a fun thing to do and, and encouraging them to go ahead and do it and then collaborating with them all the way through. Um, so I hope that some of that will come out of his lectures, you know, if we have some new experiments that come as a result of the things that, that Peter talked to you about today, then we will definitely have done our job. So with that, Peter, uh, take it away. Uh, wow, thank you, Yoni. That was a, that was a very nice introduction. Um, and thank you to all the organizers of the school. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, as Yoni said, I'm going to be giving the next couple lectures and, and uh, I'm going to be aiming to sort of make them kind of broad introductions to this area of using quantum sensing for some sort of fundamental physics. Um, uh, also, let's see, uh, as Yoni mentioned, it is a little early for me, so sorry, I'm, I'm still kind of waking up. Uh, and in fact, I, I do really want to encourage you um, to ask a lot of questions, interrupt me uh, if you have any, you know, if something I say is confusing at all. Um, the, uh, you know, I have, I'll be lecturing for about the next three hours. Uh, so if it's just me talking the whole time, uh, that'll, that'll really be terrible. <laughs> that'll, that'll really get kind of boring. So I don't want that. Um, so please do, I think you can uh, raise hand or also um, just put a question in the chat or just write in the chat that you have a question. Um, and then either Yoni or myself will, will notice it hopefully um, and, uh, and unmute you and let you ask. Um, and actually to, to practice that, um, since it's early for me, uh, how about, can, can everyone tell me sort of uh, where they are in particular? Can you, can you write into the chat um, what time it is where you are? So it's, uh, it's 7, 7, 17 in the morning for me. So I put that in the chat, but I'd like all the students to, to make sure you can actually access the chat. Perfect. All right. <laughs> and it's interesting to see. Looks like we have people all over. All right. Excellent. Good. And in case you, you haven't found it, this gives you good practice to find the chat. All right. Okay, good. Thanks. So, so please um, do uh, uh, interrupt me all the time, ask questions. Um, I've prepared a bunch of material, but obviously this is sort of a, a huge field at this point with many, many, many papers and far more than I could say even in my three lectures. So um, I won't even, uh, I, I have no need to cover all the material I prepared. I'd much rather uh, slow down if I say something confusing and, and make sure everyone's understanding it. Um, uh, so, so please do uh, stop me if you, if you have a question, if something isn't clear, or if you just want to know more about a topic, if you're just curious or, or you disagree with something I said, this is an active area of research. Um, uh, I, hope to, I hope to convey uh, some of what's going on. So, all right. Um, and, and I did also want to say, uh, as you probably heard, uh, this is a pretty heterogeneous group of students. We have people with many different backgrounds at many different stages in their career. Um, so uh, it's a little bit difficult to prepare a lecture that's going to be perfect for everyone. In particular, things like quantum field theory and general relativity are, are really you know, prerequisites for what I do, but I'm aware that certainly um, nowhere near all the students here um, will, have, will have really studied those subjects a lot or any of the other subjects I talk about. So I'm going to try to make these lectures as accessible as possible for everyone. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I think we should still be able to, to cover a lot of interesting new material. Um, but I, but I, I do really, again, um, uh, need, your, uh, need your input um, uh, because uh, you know, there, is, there is such a broad range of backgrounds. Okay, so with that, let me get started. Let me actually make sure I can still um, see the chat in everyone's hands, okay. Um, uh, so I wanna just uh, talk a little bit about quantum sensing for fundamental physics. Hopefully um, everyone can see my screen. Yoni, let me know if you can't see my screen. Yep, we're good. Um, perfect. All right, uh, so for the next three lectures, I basically was gonna divide them in kind of two um, big, areas. The first I want to discuss, because it's so important, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about gravitational wave detection. And in particular, how to detect gravitational waves with uh, new quantum technology. I think there's a, there's a lot of excitement there, and that's a, that's a field that's really just starting to open up. So that's what I'll do probably for about, depends how long it takes, but probably for about the first lecture and a half or so. Um, uh, then about the second part, probably somewhere in the middle of uh, uh, the second lecture today, um, I want to move into talking about open questions in particle physics and cosmology, um, and in particular, uh, and, and new detectors, new, new again, new quantum sensors that could be useful uh, for answering those questions. And in particular, I'll probably focus a lot on uh, dark matter detection, looking for new particles, things like that. Okay, so to begin with, for this first lecture, lecture and a half or so, I want to talk about gravitational waves. And I'll start by saying um, why we should be interested in them. I think it's very important to always ask what the motivation is. Uh, and then most of the time I'll spend talking about how to detect them with quantum sensors, and in particular with um, atomic interferometry with uh, an ultra precise uh, cold atom technology. Uh, and then I'll also mention um, what kind of new science we get from these kind of new detectors. Um, uh, what what uh, uh, new sources and, and new interest in gravitational wave science we will be able to see once we bring these detectors online. Okay, so with that, let me jump right into the motivation. Um, uh, and I'm sure, I hope you're all aware uh, that in 2015, uh, LIGO for the first time saw a gravitational wave. And it was obviously extremely exciting. Here's the, here's the time trace of that. Here it is in frequency space, which is always a good way to think about gravitational waves as we'll, as we'll get to later. Um, and that was, of course, incredibly exciting as the first observation of a gravitational wave, also incredibly exciting uh, since it appeared to be a, a black hole binary, uh, which was not completely expected. And um, uh, uh, the masses were heavy and things like that. So we learned a lot even just from that very first event. And since then, um, there's really been a, a ton of interesting observations from the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. In particular, they discovered many black hole binaries um, very wide range of masses. You see here this nice plot that I stole uh, showing in, in solar masses, the, the masses of all the um, uh, black holes and also uh, many of the uh, uh, neutron star candidates that they've discovered here in orange. Um, you can see the progenitor masses and the black hole that they merged into when the binary merged. Um, uh, and, and you can see this covered a really wide range, including many that were um, far too heavy or far heavier than they were expected to be. And that was already, that's already a mystery. That's already a puzzle. That's already um, making people go back and rethink uh, the formation of these black holes, including the formation of stars and stellar evolution and things like that. Um, uh, in addition, of course, by watching black holes merge, we learn things about the geometry of the black hole very near the event horizon. Uh, that's something that, that there have been many papers written about over the years. Um, people even postulating very large changes to what a black hole is. Um, to, the, to the straightforward picture of a black hole that came out of general relativity so many years ago. Um, uh, LIGO is starting to already shed some light on that and, and already put constraints on new theories, for example. Um, it gives us a good test of strong field gravity, of course, by the same measure. Um, we are even in the, LIGO is even in the process of measuring uh, the spins of these black holes, which would be another very interesting um, probe of their history and their formation. Um, uh, furthermore, we've now LIGO has now seen a bunch of neutron star binaries. As you may know, the uh, mergers of these neutron stars now really appear to be uh, one of the major origins of the heavy elements in the universe, these so-called kilonovas. We also, with future observations, will learn more things about the internal state of neutron stars. Neutron stars are some of the, the densest, most compact uh, objects in the universe, the highest density uh, environments in the universe. 
And they probe things, for example, about the fundamental physics of QCD that is otherwise very difficult for us to probe in the laboratory. We can learn by learning, for example, the equation of state of a neutron star. We also learn something fundamental about QCD. Um, uh, neutrons, the, uh, looking at these neutron star binaries also has taught us about the speed of, or uh, limits on how different the speed of gravitational waves, the speed of gravity can be from the speed of light. Uh, that already put extremely tight constraints on theories of modified gravity. You know, there's a lot of questions about, about gravity, about gravity and quantum mechanics. People have come up with a lot of modified gravity theories. Um, uh, those are really put to the test by these gravitational wave observations. Um, uh, further, actually, there's a, a beautiful idea to use some of these uh, compact object binaries that LIGO is observing as uh, standard sirens, uh, essentially like standard candles. I'll, I'll get to that back to that a little bit later in the, in the lectures for measuring things like the Hubble scale and the equation of state of dark energy for measuring cosmological distances. Okay, so um, that's sort of what we're, we're already learning from gravitational waves, which I think is a, a huge amount and extremely exciting. And, and we really just scratched the surface. Um, uh, if you were following the progress of LIGO, you saw that we went from sort of a couple observations in the first year to more and more and more as the years went on. And I think as we, as we continue to improve the existing gravitational wave observatories, and even as uh, new gravitational wave observatories come online, that, that field is really just gonna explode. Um, actually, so let me let me uh, pause there for a second and ask: Are there any questions on this motivation? Of course, this is I'm still I haven't uh, you know told you a lot of specifics, but any thoughts about this or any things that I've missed? Any other reasons you think uh, gravitational wave observations are interesting? Okay, all right. Um, let me go on and and try to say in a little more detail. Why is observing gravitational waves so useful? What is it about them that's so useful? Um, I think it's really fair to say, as is often said, that they, they open a new window onto the universe. And in particular, because they have two key properties, right? So, so far, essentially everything we know about the universe, all of our understanding of distant stars and galaxies and clusters and the history of the origin of the universe and all that um, comes from electromagnetic observations, right? And those are obviously amazing. We've learned a ton from them. But gravitational waves really are very different. First, they're sourced by mass, not charge, right? So things like black holes are extremely bright. They're some of the brightest sources of gravitational waves. Obviously, um, they're not often extremely bright sources of electromagnetic waves, although we knew about some black holes from electromagnetic observations. Uh, immediately, as you saw, the number of black holes we've seen has just skyrocketed <laughs> just from sort of the very first gravitational wave observations. Same things with other compact objects like neutron stars and white dwarfs, because they're, they're very high density, large amounts of mass into small spaces, um, they're perfect sources for gravitational waves, right? You know, the way you create an electromagnetic wave, uh, as I'm sure you remember from your EM class, is you take a charge and you shake it. Uh, same thing, that's how you create a gravitational wave. It's even easier. You take any mass at all and you shake it, right? But of course, the larger the mass, the, the larger the effective gravitational charge is. Um, the bigger the gravitational wave will be. And so it's, it's really these very high density objects, things like black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs that are excellent, very bright gravitational wave sources. And also because they're um, sourced by mass and not charge, it really gives us some very unique information on these objects, right? We, we learn things that we wouldn't learn from electromagnetism. Um, so we're learning, we're really seeing essentially the gravitational field instead of the electromagnetic field. We're seeing things like what's going on near the horizon of a black hole and things like that. Uh, and the kind of second property is that gravitational waves are very weakly interacting, which is uh, a problem in the sense that it made it very hard to see them, makes it very hard to see them. So we have to build extremely precise detectors, um, very sensitive detectors, uh, but it also uh, has a real benefit which is they can, for example, come to us from the very early universe, from a time in the universe when the universe was, was very high density, very high temperature, et cetera, long before the formation of the CMB. In fact, essentially all the way back, as far as we, uh, as far as we know, all the way back to inflation and reheating and things like that, the universe was transparent to gravitational waves. You'd have to get to extremely high densities before the universe was opaque to gravitational waves which means they're perhaps the only way we're ever gonna have of looking directly at the universe before the time of last scattering, before the CMB was formed. Um, so that makes it an extremely uh, exciting probe to learn more about the birth of the universe and early universe cosmology. For example, uh, things like reheating or, or phase, transition, phase transitions in the early universe 
can be uh, very strong sources of gravitational waves. Okay, um, uh, and in particular, I wanna point out that uh, I, I think it's gonna be a very analogous situation to uh, what we had with the electromagnetic spectrum. And the electromagnetic spectrum, right? We, you start by making a telescope that can observe in the optical, um, and you learn a lot from that, but obviously every new band that's opened, right? Uh, the infrared, the X-ray, the, the microwave for sure, or the CMB, every new band that's opened gave huge amounts of new information about our universe and many unexpected discoveries too, right? Lots of things that we, we didn't project, um, we didn't predict, but, but once you started looking at that band, like the microwave is famous for this, as I, I hope you know the story of the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, um, uh, you found many new things that weren't expected. Gravitational waves give an entirely new spectrum, the gravitational spectrum. It's already clear that there's a ton of interesting things to see in it. And I think um, as we open every new piece of the gravitational spectrum, every new, every new frequency band uh, for gravitational waves, we're just gonna see many new things and, and learn a ton of new physics. Um, <clears throat> so I really think, as I said, that gravitational waves are really gonna be a major part of the future of astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, uh, maybe even high energy physics if we learn things about the early universe or about uh, black holes, things like that. So I think for that reason, it is absolutely crucial that we find a way to observe as many different bands of the gravitational spectrum as possible. So here is kind of the, the current um, state of the art. We have, this is a, we're gonna see more of, many more of these plots. So let me just um, say what's going on here. This is a plot of the characteristic strain of the gravitational wave, essentially the amplitude of the gravitational wave versus its frequency. And here you see uh, sensitivity curves for advanced LIGO, um, LISA, and some pulsar timing arrays. Uh, and you can see these cover a wide range of frequencies. So LIGO is around 10 to 100 hertz or so, up to kilohertz. Um, the proposed LISA detector is at more like 10 to the minus 2 hertz. Pulsar timing arrays come in at these very low frequencies of about a period of about a year or more. Um, and you can see together, they already cover large chunks of the gravitational spectrum, which is fantastic all the way from sort of nanohertz to kilohertz. Um, and there's many sources. This, this, um, this kind of graphic just sort of schematically shows a few of the, the sources that could be seen by these observatories. Um, and this is fantastic. And we'll get a lot of science from this when, for example, LISA does launch. And as these pulsar timing arrays uh, continue to improve and the sensitivity curve moves down this plane to, to smaller and smaller strains, we'll learn more and more. But I also wanted to point out that we're missing some things. There are some gaps here. Right, in particular between LIGO and LISA around the Hertz scale and also below uh, LISA to down above the pulsar timing arrays around microhertz or so, there's some really um, uh, important windows being missed and, and there's a lot of interesting sources and science in there. Um, and I think it's really important that we come up with new possible detectors, new possible te detection techniques to try to cover this entire spectrum, to try to cover the entire gravitational spectrum. Uh, for the future, because I think that's really going to be a, a major part of the future of, of astrophysics. Okay, um, let me just pause there for a second and, and ask if there's any questions so far. Oh, great. That's a great question. So um, uh, let's see, actually, do you, Yoni, can you um, unmute our Abdella? Yeah, just one second. Okay, go ahead, please. Do you want to just repeat your question for everybody? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right, so I was just asking um, how robust these uh, gravitational waves are to the surrounding environment, including massive objects and black holes. Yeah, actually, that that's a great question, um, and there's a lot. There's a sort of a bunch of interesting answers to that. Um, uh, so um, let me let me say the first, which is, let's say I have some gravitational waves that I want to see. Maybe they're coming from some black hole binary, you know, halfway across the universe. And of course, they have to. I think I think one of the things you're asking is they have to fly all the way to us on the Earth, um, past lots of other things in the universe, right? Um, lots of other masses, um, galaxies, and also very compact objects like black holes and neutron stars and things like that. Uh, so what happens? Um, so, so here's a kind of um, uh, uh, rough um, thing to keep in mind, which is that uh, gravitational waves will, in many cases, act a lot like light, as in 
if you pass by a galaxy or you pass near a, a black hole or a star or something, they will get gravitationally lensed. So I, I won't talk too much about this, but I hope um, hopefully you've all heard about the fact that light gets bent by gravity, that the light doesn't just travel in a, in a quote unquote straight line. That's right. um, good. Uh, and so, so gravity waves will be just like light. They follow those null geodesics, if you're familiar with that, if you take in general relativity. So they would, they would get lensed and things like that um, by galaxies, by objects. Um, uh, so, so that definitely happens. Of course, as you may know, gravitational lensing is a, is a sort of fairly weak phenomenon. We, we see it, but we have to work hard to see it. And, and most sources come to us without being significantly lensed. So we don't expect that to be a, a major effect on too many of the sources. Um, and then gravitational waves themselves actually can pass through almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> they can't pass through black holes because nothing can pass through black holes, but they can otherwise pass through essentially everything, even neutron stars. And one way to see that if you're a little bit familiar with general relativity is um, we often in general relativity to understand the propagation of gravitational waves, we do a perturbative expansion. We expand in the small, in, in weak gravity, okay? And in particular, um, the strain, this is what I'm plotting on the y-axis, this h, you see that's an absurdly small number. <laughs> Um, so it's a, we expand in, in this strain in H, and you can see that's a very good expansion. You pretty much have to only work to linear order because the second order term is down by a whole lot. Um, there's very tiny numbers on the y-axis. Um, and also, let's say you're trying to pass through a neutron star or a regular star or galaxy. Uh, when you expand, um, uh, you would expand in the potential, and the gravitational potential of those objects are all very weak. They're all much less than one. Even, even neutron stars, the gravitational potential gets large, but it's no more than a tenth or so. Uh, when the gravitational potential, and by the gravitational potential, I, I mean gm over r, sorry to be clear, uh, that hits one, order one, only for a black hole. Uh, in fact, that's sort of a definition of a black hole. Uh, and anything else in our universe is going to be much smaller than one. Neutron stars come the closest, uh, but they're still much smaller than one. They're still less than a tenth or so. Um, and that more or less uh, very roughly tells you that not much is going to happen to the gravitational wave. Now, of course, that was a, a quick answer, um, uh, but in fact, it'll turn out that it will pass right through. And, and actually, um, a sort of interesting, uh, this, this is a complete tangent, but since you brought it up, uh, something that I and, and several other people have played around with some uh, kind of fun idea to think about um, uh, for, uh, you know, if you're, if you're bored sometime, is um, gravitational waves do pass through all these very dense objects like neutron stars. Maybe they could probe the neutron star. Maybe they could tell us something about the internal structure of the neutron star. <laughs> um, so that's a fun idea. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it for you to think about. It's something um, uh, I've thought about some and other people have too. Thank you so um, much. But well, go on, yeah. Sorry, um, so I was just gonna say, did, did that answer the question? So basically they make it to us through the universe unattenuated, even the, the small black holes that are in the way, although they will absorb any gravitational wave falling on them because they're so small, black holes are so dense, they become very small. Any gravitational wave that's propagated some large distance from its source um, just diffracts around the small absorber, which is the black hole. Um, uh, the wavelengths are often larger than the black holes, even if they're not, uh, you just eat up a small piece of the wave front and the, the gravitational wave will diffract around it. And none of the rest of the mass in the universe, galaxies and clusters and things like that will do much to it. Um, uh, so they will basically come to us unattenuated unless there was some very close black hole that would be then sort of part of the generation mechanism of the gravitational wave. Um, did, that, did that answer the question? Perfect, thank you so much. Great, yeah, that, that's a great question, actually. There's a lot of interesting things to be said there. So <laughs> um, any other questions? Feel free to either raise your hand or just write in the chat that you have a question. Okay, great. All right, so let me go on. Where was I? Okay. Um, uh, so uh, I just wanted to point out, so, so I just said on the previous slide, I said we, um, we really want to look in as many bands of the gravitational spectrum as possible, right? So obviously what we have operating right now are things like LIGO and Virgo, these really amazing um, laser interferometer detectors. And you can see here a sort of more detailed breakdown of the noise sources in LIGO and Virgo. So it's an interesting question to ask, okay, these detectors are working great. Uh, maybe we can push them. What, you know, how, how come they're in this frequency range? Could they go bigger? Could they go to a, more, uh, a larger part of the, of the spectrum? 
And in particular, I'm going to focus um, uh, most on lower frequencies. Um, that's where we expect more of the astrophysical and cosmological sources to be, although there could be interesting things at high frequency too. Um, uh, in particular, high frequency, you can see it's, it's mostly the photon shot noise. It's mostly, if you like, the power of the laser that we can put through. And there may even be um, sort of fancy quantum tricks, as you may know, squeezing of the light and things like that to improve on that. Um, but at low frequencies below kind of uh, 10 hertz or so, um, and, and this, is a, this is a sort of schematic plot. You shouldn't take these numbers precisely. Um, in fact, this lower plot may be slightly more accurate, but you can, you can see it here too. You can see what's happening at low frequencies. It's due to things like seismic noise or the thermal noise in the suspension, okay? The suspension being the, the LIGO has, you know, two mirrors at the end of their laser interferometer and, and the, uh, the, the strings, essentially, that the mirrors are hung from. Um, uh, so it's, it's those kind of noise sources. And that's actually what always comes in on the left side of any gravitational wave uh, sensitivity curve, any gravitational wave detector. Um, on the left side is cut off by essentially how good a proof mass you are. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but roughly we, LIGO wants its two mirrors to be essentially free floating in space and it wants to look at the distance between them and see a gravitational wave come through and wiggle space, make that distance change. Um, but if something else is wiggling the proof masses, uh, that of course gets in the way, that, that is noise. And, and so for LIGO, you can see the shaking of the earth, for example, is right now, we believe a, a very dominant noise source at low frequencies and really is responsible for the very sharp cutoff in the LIGO sensitivity curve at low frequencies below about 10 hertz or so. Um, and, the, and they work very hard to vibration isolate their masses, but even, even after all that sort of fantastic work, um, seismic noise just gets so strong. The earth shakes more and more as you go to lower and lower frequencies, larger and larger amplitude of, of shaking of the earth. Um, uh, it really cuts off the sensitivity curve of LIGO and, and any gravitational wave detectors like that. OK. Um, so I think that that then sort of immediately raises the question, um, how could we do better? Um, oh yeah, I just wanted to point out, so it's the main, mainly the seismic noise, um, also to do with the suspension. Um, how could we do better? Um, and uh, uh, for that, like I said, I, I really want to suggest that we should look at new detection techniques. We have all these amazing technologies, um, uh, very high precision quantum sensors that people are developing. Um, maybe we could apply some of that technology to this very important search for gravitational waves. And I, I think we really want a, a wide variety of things. Just like you build very different kinds of telescopes for different bands in the electromagnetic spectrum, I think we're going to want a wide variety of different kinds of gravitational wave detectors in order to probe the whole gravitational spectrum. OK, um, so with that, let me turn to um, uh, the next topic, which is now specifically, let me try to uh, get into how can we detect gravitational waves with these uh, with new quantum technologies. Just to motivate that, um, you may have seen this plot before, but I think it's very important and very interesting. So it's worth showing. Um, why am I talking about these kind of quantum technologies? In some sense, why why do we have a school on this? Uh, here's here's one reason, just one. There are many reasons, but here's one plot. This is a plot of the sensitivity of atomic clocks. Um, versus time, versus when the atomic clocks were made. Uh, and you can see they've been improving very rapidly. In particular, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, a gravitational wave detection with the technology which is essentially very similar to or identical to this optical, these red dots, these optical um, atomic clocks. And you can see why, essentially, right here, they've been improving extremely rapidly, right? They make an order of magnitude of progress and sensitivity every few years, which is sort of astounding. Um, you know, if we had uh, particle colliders that made an order of magnitude progress in energy every few years, that we'd, we'd already have uh, learned amazing things. So whenever you have a technology like this that's improving so rapidly, I think that's really worth paying attention to and, and thinking carefully about thinking, what can, we, what can we get out of it? Okay, so with that, um, let me stop sharing here and go to my quote unquote board. And while I'm doing that, um, if anyone has any more questions about this sort of intro, um, please ask. Give me one second, sorry, to get my iPad out. All right. Okay. All right. So any more questions about the intro or anything before I go on, go on now, I want to go kind of into some uh, uh, real details of 
how to look for gravitational waves with this uh, atomic clock type technology. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I want to start just by telling you um, what atomic clocks are and, and kind of build up how we're going to use them. Um, uh, to begin with, actually, I should say that uh, I'm really a high energy theorist or a, a particle theorist. Um, and so uh, I always work in this funny system of units. So for the next, uh, for all my lectures, at the very least, uh, I'm going to be uh, using units where h bar and c are one. Uh, if you are familiar with this, uh, great. Um, but if you're not, that's going to be kind of weird at first. So let me just point out uh, a few of the crucial things to keep in mind, OK? So when I've set them to one, I, I really do mean it. So I mean, for example, that uh, if I have 310 to the 8 meters, that is exactly equal to one second, OK? So I can trade uh, units of time and units of length back and forth. Um, and also, if you work it out, a, a very useful conversion to keep in mind that we're going to use a few times throughout these lectures uh, uh, using also h bar equals 1. So this first one, of course, is using c equals 1. Using also h bar equals 1, uh, you can show yourself uh, that 0.2 GeV times a femtometer is roughly 1. This is, this is approximate. Um, uh, or this is 200 MeV times a femtometer. That You remember that because that's about the scale of a QCD of a nucleus. Um, uh, but this lets you convert between energies and distances or times. OK, and so we're going to use that a bunch. And in particular, uh, note that uh, the units of time are the same as the units of position, uh, which are the inverse of the units of energy and the inverse of the units of momentum. OK, um, actually, one of the reasons this is so useful is because these units essentially immediately encode the uncertainty principle. Right. Uh, you know that if I, for example, and this is going to come up later, if I have, let's say, a dark matter particle and I uh, uh, know something about its momentum, then I can also know something about the spread and its position um, that's sort of immediately encoded in these units. You're, you're always reminded of that by these units. OK, so first, any questions on that? All right, good. By the way, you um, might want a pencil and paper. I'm going to try to actually um, have a few things that you can compute yourself. So I would recommend having some pencil and paper handy. Um, and even if you haven't seen these unit conversions before, uh, maybe write them down since we will use them. Um, and I, I haven't found a good way to keep them on the screen at the same time as the rest of my notes, unfortunately. Sorry about that. OK. All right, but so um, with that, now I want to go on and uh, discuss these atomic techniques. And in particular, I want to tell you about uh, atom interferometry. What is it? Um, and actually, I want to begin just with my sort of cartoon uh, theorist cartoon of what an atomic clock is. OK, so this will not be anywhere near all the details of the atomic clock, but it'll be the important things that we're going to need to know for the rest of this uh, lecture. OK, um, uh, so uh, what is what is an atomic clock? Very roughly, uh, very roughly. Imagine I have some atom and it has two energy levels. I'll call them one and two which have some energy splitting delta E between them, OK? Uh, and I want both of these to be metastable levels. They live a long time. And for the so-called optical clocks, uh, as I was showing you on that last slide there, what that really means is that delta E is in the visible. Uh, the energy splitting between these two states is in the visible uh, optical light range, which is about an electron volt, OK? That's about the energy of visible light. OK. So then how do you make an atomic clock with this atom? So let's, let's imagine, let me really simplify the picture and imagine I just have an atom that has only these two metastable states. Uh, what do we do? Well, uh, first, I want to start with the atom. Let's, let's start with the atom in state one, the ground state, OK? Uh, and then I'm going to apply what I'll call a beam splitter. By the way, if you can't, my handwriting is usually pretty bad. So if you can't read my handwriting, please let me know. <laughs> just, just type it in the chat or something. Um, I'll apply a beam splitter. And what that does is it splits the uh, quantum state of the atom. It doesn't, it doesn't split the atom, as in uh, nuclear physics. It splits the quantum state of the atom in two, into a linear superposition of one and two. Okay. 
Uh, don't worry, I'll tell you about how that works in just a second. Just uh, assume for now that I've got such a thing that I can do that, okay? Uh, then all I do is I just wait. I wait some time, I'll call capital T the interrogation time, okay? And then what do I have? Well, you know from quantum mechanics what I have up to some overall phase factor, right? Uh, the uh, evolution of this state is just given by the Hamiltonian, right? And there's just an energy difference. These are otherwise energy eigenstates, but there's just an energy splitting between one and two. Uh, and so two evolves with some relative phase like this. Okay. Um, is that clear? Hopefully, is that clear so far? Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, you know, uh, some overall phase factor difference between these two parts of the wave function is not um, immediately measurable like this, right? But we can make it measurable by making an interferometer out of this, okay? By interfering these two paths. These are, these are paths now in some sense in, in Hilbert space. Uh, that the atom is taken either either through state one or through state two. And the way we would interfere them actually is just apply the exact same beam splitter again. Okay, so if I apply the same beam splitter again, it's going to do the same thing it did before. This is this is linear, right? Like uh, quantum mechanics is linear evolution in time. Uh, so this beam splitter acts on this first half of the wave function the exact same way it did before. It splits it into these two states. And then it also acts on the second half. It sort of has to, by unitarity, split it in, into a linear combination of one and two although with a minus sign, as I will write for you. Uh, so this splits it. The final state that you get out looks like this. Uh, and so this uh, first part of the wave function, number one, has been split into these two terms here. And the second part of the wave function number two has, of course, been split into these other two terms there. Okay. That's the action of this final beam splitter, which uh, turns this into an interferometer. All right. And then uh, by interferometer, I mean I can measure the amount of the wave function. So I, I talked about it, by the way, as putting a single atom through here. In reality, we usually try to put as many atoms as possible to get as, as good statistics as possible. Um, but I can measure the number of atoms here in each of these so-called output ports. Let me call it N1, the number of atoms in state one, and N2, the number of atoms in state two, okay? And don't worry for a second about how I do that, um, but I can, I can measure this, I can measure this uh, coefficient of the wave function in front of each of these, uh, uh, in, in each of these uh, states, the amount, of, the amount of the atom in state one and the amount of the atom in state two. Um, and you can see then what's happened, right? I've turned something that was just a phase difference between these two parts of the wave function into a number difference, right? And in particular, focus on this sign, this this plus or minus sign. By the way, uh, it, the beam splitter has to. You can you can do you can calculate that for a real beam splitter, but also you can convince yourself it had to do that uh, by unitarity <laughs> in order to maintain unitarity of the wave function. Um, uh, but you can see what that's done. That's turned what was just a phase factor into a number difference between the number of atoms in state one and state two, right? Okay, um, uh, and that'll depend on this uh, phase shift delta E times T. All right, so first, any questions on that? This is, this is kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go slowly on this because this is kind of the heart of everything I'm gonna say. Uh, so, so I wanted to make sure you get um, this idea firmly in mind. Okay, um, so, <clears throat> And by the way, you might want to um, uh, write down, I'm going to try to see if I can keep this on the screen, but you might want to write down this final state for what I need to do next, okay? Which is, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, uh, so in just a second, actually, we're going to see if we can put you into some breakout rooms uh, and, and let you do a little bit of work. I figured if I just talked for three hours straight, everyone would fall asleep. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to let you also get a little bit of practice in to make sure you, you know you understand what's going on. So I want to know, um, uh, what is the uh, sensitivity of the atomic clock? By sensitivity, in this case, I mean, for example, how small a time can I measure? How precisely can I measure time? So what error on T, okay, can I measure the time with the clock? Um, if, and then the following questions, okay? 
uh, what if I use, I put just one atom through this atomic clock sequence, okay? Uh, what if instead I put N independent atoms through this atomic clock sequence I just showed you? Um, and then finally, uh, and oh, and I should say, I wanted to ask too, um, for you to think about, does it matter if I put them through all at the same time or sequentially? Uh, and finally, um, uh, as sort of an extra question, uh, what if I put um, N, entangled atoms, okay, through. Uh, and what I mean by entangled in this case is I use um, a beam splitter, which is a little fancier, <laughs> actually a lot fancier than the one I was just showing you. Uh, what if the beam splitter does this? So if I put an, an atoms through, let's say they all start in state one. Okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm drawing it like this. All the n atoms start in state one. After I put it through the beam splitter, the action of the beam splitter is to turn them into this linear combination. They're all in state one plus one over root two, they're all in state two, okay? Um, uh, so that's a highly entangled state. Um, what does that do? What's that sensitivity? Uh, how sensitive is, if I, ha if I could do that, uh, how sensitive is the atomic clock, okay? Um, so we're going to try a little experiment. I don't know if this is going to work well, um, uh, but um, because this is the first lecture, uh, I thought it'd be really nice if we could put everyone, all the students into, um, into little breakout rooms, um, partly to, to get you thinking about this physics, but actually also a, a big part of this is, you know, one thing that's um, really valuable about summer schools is meeting the other students, <laughs> perhaps even more important than listening to all these lectures. Um, by us, by us older people, is uh, actually talking to your peers and meeting the other students. And I think we have a really interesting group of students with a really wide range of backgrounds. Um, so I wanted to at least give you some chance to meet a couple other students. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to to mock up the full experience of being in person, but um, so when you go into the breakout room, please actually you should have like just two or three students in the breakout rooms. Please um, introduce yourselves. Uh, you know, say where you're from. If you can, please turn on your camera um, and your mic. Um, uh, I know not everyone is going to have enough internet bandwidth and things like that to do that, but but ideally, and and just maybe mention what you're working on, what research you're working on. So why don't you actually go around the breakout rooms first, and everyone introduce themselves and and say where they are and and what uh, research they're working on or what they're thinking about, um, and then um, see if you can answer together, work together, and and try to figure out the answers to all these questions. Okay, um, so I'll give you, I don't know, 10-ish minutes or something in the breakout room. So um, is that clear first, actually, before we go in, does anyone have any questions about that, about um, any of these questions, about what I mean? Okay, great. And then um, Yoni, um, could you try opening breakout rooms? I, I, ideally, let's see if we have about 50 people, um, maybe about um, 20 breakout rooms or so. Yep, I got people in in groups of two or three. Sorry, people are just leaving. Um, so let me try to re-equalize things. All right. Uh, so yeah, it's probably the most important think, thing is you introduce each other, you, yourselves, <laughs> so you get to meet I, each I think, other. I think we should be good. And if I accidentally put any of the co-hosts of the school in a breakout room, then you can feel free to introduce yourself, but maybe don't solve the problems with the students. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, perfect. All right. All right, let's see, it looks like, I think we managed to get pretty much everyone in. Yeah, so I think I had to do that manually because Zoom doesn't have a thing where it's like, don't assign co-host to, anyway, so. Oh, oh no, that's annoying. <laughs> Uh, let's okay. see. All right. It looks like we got everyone. Yes. Um, uh, yes. And um, 
because my kid is now playing with laundry, I'm going to go deal with that, but I will check back in. <laughs> go for it. And are you able to make, no, we can't have two hosts, right? Um, Cause I was just going to check if I was actually able to enter, hold on, let me just stop my share for a second. I can put you in rooms if you want to. I know, but you have to like physically move me back and forth, right? Right. Um, um, I mean, do you want to be the host? I'm happy to switch you to host if you want. Uh, maybe make me host just for the next few minutes while you're gone right. and then I can right. hop in and out and then I can put yeah. you back, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I think, let's see, we've got almost everyone back. All right. Maybe if people wouldn't mind turning off their videos once they're back in the room just for bandwidth purposes. Thanks. All right, although it was nice to see all you, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> um, okay, great. All right, so I think, good, I think everyone's back. So, <clears throat> all right, great. So I, I hope you had a chance actually mainly to meet each other because as I said, that's one of the most important functions of a summer school <laughs> that we're probably lacking a little bit this time and introduce yourselves to at least a couple other people. Um, I know uh, the people I met in my summer schools, I'm still in touch with many years later now. Um, uh, okay, so, and, and I hope, by the way, I, I gave you a bunch of questions to think about, and the main point was not actually for you to be able to answer them all in the, in the small amount of time I gave you. It was more just to start thinking about them. Um, I'm gonna ask you a few more questions throughout these lectures. I don't know whether we'll do breakout rooms or not, but I'll, I'll ask a few more questions, and that's always the goal, just for you to start thinking about it so that when I go over it, um, uh, you're, you're sort of prepared already to hear the answer. I, I don't actually expect you to solve it <laughs> necessarily in the time. Okay, but I got a lot, as I was popping around to some of the rooms, I didn't make it to all of them, but I got a lot of great questions about what I mean. So, so this is great. So let me now try to say very specifically what I mean. And as a, um, a couple of you pointed out, oh, I have to share my screen again, sorry. <clears throat> okay, um, as a couple of you pointed out, um, you know, measuring with just one atom is sort of a degenerate case and always a little bit silly because there'll be lots of issues that happen with one atom. Uh, so of course, as for, for the sensitivity with one atom, I really just kind of meant the sensitivity with n atoms and the limit that n goes to one. It, it could just be an easier way to start thinking about it depending on how you, how you want to think. Um, but in particular, what did I mean by sensitivity? Well, I meant, let's say we do this interferometer sequence, yeah? And I put some number of atoms through. And at the end, I get some atoms in state one and state two, and I count them, some green atoms and some blue atoms or whatever, right? And I see how many fell into one state and how many fell into the other state. Well, um, you can see that, look, um, depending on um, uh, how long this T is, that will change this phase shift delta E times T. And it goes from you know zero to pi over two to pi to three pi over two, da, da, da. And and, oh, and by the way, remember, as I was just telling you before, that the units of energy are the inverse of the units of time. So I've, I've dropped some h bars and stuff here, right? So this is a dimensionless number as it has to be in the exponent. Um, as this phase shift goes between zero and pi over two and pi and blah, 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 um, this number of atoms will fluctuate order one, okay? In fact, you don't even have to calculate it very precisely. Uh, all you really need to know is uh, you can sort of see that it'll fluctuate order one, okay? Um, and, and stop me if anything I say isn't clear. Um, uh, okay, so um, therefore I'm, I'm sensitive to small differences in time. If the time increases by some small amount delta T, which makes this whole phase shift change by order one radian, right? Then I'll totally order one change the number of atoms I measure in state one versus state two. Okay, is that clear? Are there questions on that? <clears throat> I want to go slow because this is sort of the heart of everything I'm going to say. I'm going to I'm going to go a little faster uh, um, soon, but but this is kind of the heart of it. Um, so uh, if I use just one atom, I'm really only sensitive to a whole one radian phase shift. Okay, so if if this delta e times t this quantity changes by a whole radian order one radian, um, that's what I'm sensitive to. So what is that? <clears throat> well, if delta e uh, times t is order one. In fact, maybe I should write this since I'm writing a sensitivity. Let me write it as delta t 
is order one, right? This actually is the uncertainty relation. Normally you'd have had an H bar here, <laughs> but this is the uncertainty relation. Uh, this tells me that I'm sensitive to uh, delta Ts to, to times that are about of the size one over delta E, okay? And if I put in uh, one over an electron volt and you use some of those conversions I was giving you up here, uh, then you can calculate in time that this is about 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So think about that for a second. That is very impressive, right? That means if the time changes by a femtosecond, okay, if the amount of time I, I measure with the clock between start and finish, between first beam splitter and second beam splitter, changes by a femtosecond, then this radian, this changes by order one radian. And the number of atoms, you know, you go from an atom and like mostly in state one to mostly in state two or vice versa. Okay. So that's a, a, a black white change I could see with even a single atom. Okay. Of course, a single atom is a little degenerate. Actually, you'd really want to measure at least several. Um, uh, but, but at least in principle, as a theoretical thing, uh, if there were no other noise sources and things like that, that's something I could see with even a single atom. Is that clear? Are there questions on that? <clears throat> so the answer to this question number one was the sensitivity is something like a femtos. Well, it's one over delta E is the answer. And if you put an electron volt for the energy splitting of the atom between the two levels, one and two, then it's about a femtosecond of sensitivity. So that right there tells you why atomic clocks are so darn good. <laughs> Even a single atom is excellent. Um, so any questions on that? Okay. And for number two, you can see, well, here I'm sensitive to phase shifts, delta E times T. I haven't put just one atom through. I put N atoms through, right? And you know the shot noise limit on experiments. If it's just a bunch of N, N independent trials is one over root N, right? I can, I can measure this quantity, the number of atoms in this state, which is ultimately a measurement of this phase of, of how I can measure small changes in this phase of size one over root N. Okay, so I could measure delta E, whoops, delta E, delta T to one over root N. Then I get a time uncertainty, which goes like, you know, one over root N times delta E, which is improved over this 10 to the minus 15 seconds by whatever N I can put through. For example, if I can put, you know, let's say if N is, um, for example, if N is 10 to the 12 atoms, 10 to the six atoms per shot is something they can do pretty easily and take about 10 to the six shots take about a shot every second. Um, uh, then I have uh, sensitivity. This root n is 10 to the minus 6. So I have like 10 to the minus 21 second sensitivity or something like that. Incredible. <laughs> OK, so that's how good. That's how come atomic clocks can be so good. Is that clear? Are there questions on that? OK. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, to introduce a little bit of the um, uh, entanglement to this story. Uh, if I put these um, n atoms, but now they're entangled through, so they're not independent atoms anymore, right? They're entangled with each other. The beam splitter does this one, 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 and two, 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 two. What's going to happen? So I don't want to rewrite this whole sequence, um, but I'm just going to uh, modify it a little bit. Um, if instead of, of this, I have a whole lot of other atoms, I'll just try to squeeze it in there, okay? And this becomes one, 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 and two, 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 two. Well, then as the phase evolves, I hope you will believe that I just pick up an N here. Okay. Is that clear? Because now I've got a state, all N atoms are in state two. They have an energy which is N delta E higher than state one. So I just get N delta E up here. Is that clear? Are there questions on that? Okay, um, and then uh, if I have you know n delta e here and n delta e here, then you can see what the answer is now. However, at this point though, I should say, it's back to being like I have one big atom, one big degree of freedom made up by all the atoms in state two or all the atoms in state one. So I can only measure these two output ports. Instead of getting n independent measurements, I can only measure these two output ports, but each phase is n times bigger, okay? So in that case, for question number three, my phase shift is N delta E delta T, but I can only measure it to about one radian. 
This is one way of describing it. So this measures delta t to one over n delta e. So you can see what quantum mechanics has bought me. Instead of root n, I get a whole n. And for example, with the numbers up here, that would be you know a million times better even. <laughs> That's not actually doable yet. This, this beam splitter I told you about is something that you know, has been a dream of, of people for a long time. But uh, there's a little bit of squeezing, a little bit of entanglement is possible so far, but nothing close to going all the way to, to an N enhancement. Um, but they, people have demonstrated a little bit past root N. OK, so that's the basic idea of the atomic clock. Are there any questions on that before I go on? Uh, let's see, Yoni, there is a question. Can you unmute? Uh, yep, just give me one second. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Go on. So in this case, it's better to have an entangling setup to, in this case, for better the sensi the sensitivity. That's right. It, it's in this case, it would be better to have entangled because you can see I have a, a bigger number in the denominator. So yeah. I couldn't quite hear you, but I hope this is the question. A um, uh, bigger number in the denominator, meaning I'll get a smaller delta t, and so I can measure time more precisely. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so this, the atomic clock, is the basic heart of everything I'm going to talk about, and and basically this is how we're going to detect gravitational waves. Okay. But but I do have to dress it up with a little bit more complication, and that's what I'm going to tell you now. Um, but again, please um, stop me with any questions. Um, so we're actually going to be using a more complicated um, sequence than just this uh, simple beam splitter beam splitter sequence. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through why. Uh, and in particular, atomic clocks are usually made by cooling and trapping a whole bunch of atoms. I'm, I'm skipping uh, several Nobel prizes worth of amazing progress. Um, uh, and, and holding on to them and then, and then doing a beam splitter like I just showed you. Um, actually, we're going to use a type of atom interferometer um, uh, where the atoms are just free to float. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but essentially um, that's going to be a, a crucial change for us. Um, when we do that, so how do we make a beam splitter? I have to, I have to now tell you a little bit about the, the physics of how we actually make that beam splitter. So I have this, um, these two states for the, ato the atom, the two atomic energy levels. And uh, if I shine some laser light on them uh, with frequency or energy, the laser frequency is delta E, OK? Remember, my energy units and my frequency units are the same, since I'm working in h bar equals c equals 1. Um, well, if I, if I shine some laser light on the atom with this, with this uh, energy, with this frequency, then it'll couple the two atomic states, right? Then they're no longer um, energy eigenstates. Um, so in fact, let's say in general, if the atom is in some superposition of states one and states two, what's going to happen when I shine this laser light? Well, you know, think back to your, uh, your undergrad quantum mechanics, where you did, for example, time-dependent perturbation theory, right? This is some perturbation, some uh, uh, off-diagonal term in the Hamiltonian coupling these two uh, would have been eigenstates in the absence of the laser light. Um, and so it's going to cause Robbie flopping between the two states, right? You remember that, that time-dependent perturbation theory calculation? Um, so in particular, if I plot on this y-axis the amount of the atom in, in uh, state one and state two, for example, so these coefficients between zero and one, versus the time the perturbation is on, the time that the laser light is on, okay? Then you're going to see, see if I can draw this, if the atom starts, for example, all in state one, it'll flop down to none in state one and then come back, right? And then go on, flopping back and forth. And um, at the same time, the fraction of the atom in state two will rise up to be 100% and then fall back down. And um, you can calculate this in, in time-dependent perturbation theory. All this happens in uh, units of what's called the uh, Rabi period or the Rabi flopping frequency, which I'll just call um, omega Rabi. Um, so you can see what happens as I shine this light. Uh, if I shine the light, if I wait this amount of time here, what I call pi over two in units of the Rabi period, 
um, then the atom will switch from being entirely in state one to being a linear combination of states one and states two, right? And that's how you make a beam splitter. That's how you split the atom's wave function. Uh, so when you do that, you can see that a pi over two pulse of the laser is a beam splitter. And similarly, a pi pulse, something that's lasts this long, that completely flips the atom from state one to state two. Uh, that's what we call a mirror. And you'll see in just a second uh, why we call it a mirror pulse, um, really sort of the analog of, of LIGO's mirrors. Um, OK, is that is that clear so far? So I was, I was just to be clear, I was drawing here in this blue line the amount of the atom in state one, this C1 coefficient. And then this kind of pink line, I was drawing the amount of the atom in state two. Um, any questions on that? OK. <clears throat> Uh, now, when this happens, though, and in particular, I said it's going to be crucial for us. I haven't told you why, but it's going to be crucial for us that the atom is free. It's, it's just floating in space, OK, or falling. Um, when this happens, I have my little atom here, all right? Uh, I have my incoming laser light coming this way. You can see that actually what's going to happen, it's like the atom absorbed um, a photon, for example. Let's say it starts in state one and it transitions all the way into state two with a pi pulse or something, it's like it absorbed this photon, right? Um, and so maybe you're not surprised uh, that what happens um, in the case of absorption, where it goes from state one to state two, is that the atom gets a kick. It gets some kick K, where the amplitude of the momentum K is the momentum of the laser. And you remember for a photon, its energy equals its momentum. So the amplitude of the momentum kick to the atom is the frequency of the laser, or is the energy splitting between the two um, energy states in the atom. It's a little more complicated for the process if it started, whoop, if it started in state two and goes back to state one, which we'll also be using. Uh, in that case, if it starts in two and goes to one, you can see what this really is, OK? Uh, I had an atom here. It gets hit by this laser, uh, but um, the atom is supposed to transition downwards, right? So it's supposed to actually emit another laser photon into the laser. That's what we call stimulated emission, right? And in this case, you can see the atom actually gets that same kick K, but backwards. It gets kicked backwards, OK? All right. Well, we want to know what's happening to the atom since we're going to have it free. And then, for example, actually, the a kind of very simple example um, of the kind of pulse sequence, the kind of atom interferometer that we'd be running to detect gravitational waves would be what we call a pi over 2, pi, pi over 2 interferometer or pulse sequence. OK. Um, and we like to um, plot these things on a space time diagram. Uh, so if <clears throat> Here's the atom coming in in state one. All right. Initially, the atom is all in state one. Then at some point, it gets hit whoop, by this uh, pi over two beam splitter pulse. Right. And its wave function splits in two. So some of it continues in state one. Uh, but some of it goes into state two. And when it goes into state two, remember it's absorbed a photon. So it gets a kick. So it starts to separate spatially, like I've drawn. In practice, we often do these things vertically. So the atom's wave function would be split in two, and half of it would start to rise up above the other half. The half that's in state two would be moving faster. Uh, then you give it a pi pulse. All right. And that flips the states, remember. So the atom that was in state one now becomes in state two. But that pi pulse goes all the way through, and the atom that was in state two goes back to state one. Okay. Uh, then you hit it with a final pi over two, and that reinterferes the atoms, just like at the end of the atomic clock sequence. That what completes the interferometer, and you measure the uh, number of atoms in the two output ports in state one or state two. Okay, and that's your interferometer. That's what you count. You count the number of atoms in those two ports to measure the phase difference that. Um, one half of the atom picked up going along this trajectory versus the other half of the atom picked up going along this trajectory. 
Okay, is that clear? So that's the little shift on an atomic clock. An atomic clock was just a pi over two, pi over two, beam splitter, beam splitter. This is a beam splitter, mirror beam splitter. And maybe you can now see why we call it a mirror. It sort of looks like, ah, <laughs> it looks like a laser interferometer. Um, uh, and it's, it's kind of the mirror pulse has kind of directed the two halves of the atom back at each other so they can re-interfere. Okay. This is, we're actually going to use a, a sort of more complicated pulse sequence than this, but, but this is the basic idea. This is what you need to know. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, the final thing, the final sort of little piece of um, uh, atomic technology I want to show you, and so I should say this has all been demonstrated in the lab many times. Um, this is something they can they can do now with atoms. Um, a sort of uh, cute trick they can do, which greatly enhances your sensitivity, is the following. If I plot the energy momentum curve for uh, state one and state two, this is two and this is one. If the atom starts down here in state one, Oh, I'm sorry, there's a question uh, from Leonardo. Um, Yoni, can you unmute him? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so, hi, uh, I had one question regarding the, the previous uh, diagram. So, uh, with respect to the final pi over two pulse, shouldn't, mm -hmm. the, shouldn't both, are, sh shouldn't both the, the excited state and the ground state be divided in order to look for the interference effect? Excellent, absolutely, very good. And so, in fact, we usually draw it like this. There's some piece of the output port coming from the state one, and there's also some piece coming from the state two arm. And there's some piece of the, this second output port coming from the state two arm, and there's also some piece coming from the state one arm. Because exactly, you're right, both this half of the atom here and this half of the atom, they both get split again. The part of the atom that goes into of this atom, this half of the atom, <laughs> it gets hard to talk about. The part of this half of the atom that goes into state one goes out, goes out here. Um, the part of this half goes out here, and then you count how many atoms in state one, how many in state two, and those are really your output ports. And exactly as you say, that's what measures the interference. Exactly. That's how you interfere. Very good. And, and the laser acts on both at the same time because they're both there. Right. Um, did that answer the question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, good. So... <clears throat> Uh, let me. I just want to measure uh, mention the last little bit of technology, and then we'll take a we'll take a little break here, and I'll come back and tell you how to use this to um, look for gravitational waves. Um, the last bit of atomic technology that we need is here. Um, so if this is the energy and momentum curve of an atom, let's say in state one, right? Um, uh, then you can see if the atom starts down here in state one of the ground state, when it gets a kick, okay, it moves up to state two, right? And but it also moves right a little bit, right? It picks up some momentum. Um, if I hit it again with a laser, um, and in particular, uh, you can see, of course, if I hit it with the um, uh, uh, with this with this exact uh, mirror pulse, uh, it was previously gone to state two. If I hit it with mirror pulse, I can knock it back to the original speed in state one. But if I come from the other direction, okay, and this is what we're going to do for gravitational waves. If I come from the other direction. Uh, I will actually, the momentum kick will go the other way and the atom will get even faster, okay? And then it'll move this way on the uh, diagram here. It'll, it'll drop back to state one, yes, but it'll be faster. And in fact, you have to adjust for that by detuning your laser a little bit. This picture maybe gives you an idea, okay? You can see the sensitivity of our interferometer is essentially proportional to this open angle here or, or how much area I can get between the two arms, right? If the two arms were on top of each other, the phase shifts would be the same between the two halves of the atoms. <laughs> um, I can get a lot more opening area if I can kick this atom harder. That's one of the names of the game. And in fact, I can, I just keep doing this. I do another set of pulses like this, whoops. And then another set of pulses like this and so on. I walk it up this ladder here and that's what's called a large momentum transfer beam splitter. or sometimes we just call it LMT, beam splitter. And that's actually a crucial part of getting enough sensitivity. The more kicks I can give to this thing, that reads, if I can give N kicks to this, that reads linearly into the gravitational wave sensitivity, okay? 
that literally opens up this uh, space-time diagram for the atom interferometer. Um, uh, and that's a crucial part, actually. Right now, it's sort of really excitingly, they've been they've been working on pushing this technology as fast as possible, and they've demonstrated kicks of about a hundred, and they're working on going to about a thousand coherent kicks given to the atom without messing up the interferometer, uh, which is pretty amazing, and uh, boosts your strain sensitivity for your gravitational wave detector by a hundred or a <laughs> thousand. So, uh, very very worthwhile, um, very powerful technique. Now, I just want to mention kind of one last thing, which is. What is doing this? So this is with a single pulse, or if you do this with n pulses like this, you can imagine the interferometer is just sort of wider, has more opening area. What is it sensitive to? Why am I talking about it? Um, well, imagine this is done on the Earth, okay, which we usually do. Um, and and half the atom, you can see uh, this half the atom here. Imagine that this x. Let me re-label re it as h, height above the Earth, okay? Or actually, h is probably bad. So let me use that later. Let's call it z, height above the Earth. This half of the atom is higher always than this half, right? You can see there's always a splitting here. So if one half of the atom is always higher in the gravitational potential of the Earth, then it always has more potential energy, right? Then I'm going to get, where did it go? My favorite delta E times T phase shift for that half of the atom, right? Only you can see what we call the clock shift, the amount of time the atom spends in state two versus state one. That's going to cancel because it spends the same amount of time. Each half of the atom spends the same amount of time in the excited state, state two, by construction. But what I'm going to get instead, so this is not a clock. It cancels the clock shift, but it is an accelerometer. It measures acceleration very accurately. Okay, uh, You can see it measures acceleration because it measures how much higher in the potential this thing is. And the fact that it was gravity I was just doing um, for sort of pedagogical purposes any acceleration works the same way. This will be extremely sensitive, extremely sensitive to any acceleration. Okay, so now we have figured out how to make excellent clocks and excellent accelerometers. Those are kind of the tools, the crucial tools for doing gravitational wave detection. Um, so any questions on this before we take a break for a few minutes? Okay, great. So when we come back from the break, I'm gonna tell you how to turn these tools, use these tools um, for gravitational wave detection. But for now, um, I'm sure you could use it. I certainly could. Let's take about a, a 15 minute break and come back sort of just after um, nine o'clock, or sorry, <laughs> just take a 15 minute break. It's nine o'clock my time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 